Hi everyone, I'm Estefania Pan. Um, okay, so first I'm going to start with a brief overview about the fast fashion industry, its environmental and social impacts, and also about an introduction to sustainable fashion, ethical fashion, slow fashion, before I start with the workshop. So have you ever wondered how much impact the fast fashion industry has on the environment? To start off, the fast fashion industry is the second largest polluter in the world after the oil industry. Did you know that 20% of industrial water pollution comes from the textile treatment and dyes? This is due to the untreatment toxic wastewater from textile factories being dumped directly into rivers, contributing to water pollution, and thus making 200,000 tons of dyes being lost effluent every year. And this textile wastewater contains toxic substances such as lead and mercury, which are extremely harmful, not only for aquatic life, but also to the people that live near the river banks where it happens. That pollution then extends to the sea and eventually around the world. And in addition, um, the use of fertilizer for cotton production also heavily pollutes the run of waters and evaporation waters. Besides, the water is not only being polluted, by a high quantity of it, around 1.5 trillion liters of water per year is being consumed for dyeing and other finishing processes. Cotton, which is a high demanded but scarce resource, needs an immense amount of water to grow as it is usually cultivated in warm and dry areas. So about 200,000 liters of water is needed to produce just one kilogram of cotton. It is even making it drain water and cause the desertification of places like the RLC. Imagine that 85% of daily needs in water of the entire population of India would be covered by the quantity of water used to grow cotton in the country. And we should ask ourselves, how is it possible that 750 million people in the world do not have access to drinking water and 2.6% of the global fresh water is used only to produce cotton without including that 200 tons of fresh water used per ton of dyed fabric. Moreover, around 700,000 microfibers are released into water every time we watch a synthetic garment made of materials including polyester and nylon and that water makes its way into the ocean. The concern is that small aquatic organisms ingest those microfibers and then they are eaten by small fish, making plastic be introduced into the food chain. And it is not only released into oceans, but also into the air, as a recent study provides evidence that it happens by wearing synthetic fabrics. One person is said to release almost 300 million polyester microfibers per year to the environment by washing their clothes which is something we do on the daily. And more than 900 million to the air by simply wearing garments like we do every day. Therefore, imagine that multiple of, multiplies of the, by the population of the whole world. Likewise, as the clothing is also disposable, a lot of textile is being wasted and textile waste is being generated. Only 15% of it is recycled or donated and the rest goes directly to the landfills or is incinerated, which is a threat to the environment. And in the landfill, the garments are decomposing and releasing methane, which is a greenhouse gases, gas that's 28%, 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So the clothes decomposing in the landfill, which can lead up to 200 years since the fibers are synthetic and non-biodegradable, contribute to global warming and climate change, which are pressing issues that we face um, nowadays. If you want to get a clear idea of how much trash is being wasted, imagine the whole garbage truck of textiles. That is the amount of textile being wasted every second. Furthermore, the fashion industry is also responsible for 10% of global carbon emissions, which is a lot, as it is generate, regenerating a lot of greenhouse gases due to the energy use due, due to seed production, manufacturing, and also um, in the transportation of billions of garments purchased every year, especially in fast fashion. Also, synthetic fibers require much more energy from production than natural fibers would, and since most of our clothes are produced in countries powered by coal, such as China, Bangladesh, or India, the worst type of energy in terms of carbon emissions is being used. 
finally forests across um, across the world are being destroyed to make these fabrics we wear every day. Every year, thousands of hectares of endangered and ancient forests are cut down and replaced by plantations of trees used to make wood-based fabrics such as rayon, viscose, and model. This loss a forest is threatening to the ecosystem and also to indigenous communities. Imagine that around 120 million trees are cut down each year to make our clothes. And those environmental impacts I have just talked about are some dirty secrets that the fashion industry does not want us to know. So we keep purchasing their clothing without thinking of the negative impacts that come along. We must ask ourselves if we really want to make the choice to buy an ethical clothes without knowing all this information. And regarding the social impacts, um, can you pass us next slide? Thank you. Okay, so regarding the social impacts, it includes the horribly dangerous conditions workers face on the daily, such as low payment for all of their extremely hard and demanding work, especially since they are exposed to abounding potential harms, exploitation, unacceptable labor conditions for children. And for example, garment workers are often forced to work around 14 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, so every day a week. And they may even work until 2 or 3 a.m. to meet the fashion's rap deadline. And due to their basic wages being so low, they cannot refuse overtime, or if they refuse it, they would be fired. So their job is at risk. Therefore, we should all take these environmental and social impacts into consideration and make a well-informed decision since most of the brands we consume on the daily and we think they are not fast fashion, actually are fast fashion. So every time you want to purchase a clothing or of a new brand or an already existing brand that you already purchased from research if it actually is a fast fashion brand because many so many common brands that we do not think are fast fashion actually are fast fashion and that is a sad reality so i'm going to talk now about slow fashion okay so as we discussed previously fast fashion has a lot of environmental and also the social impacts. And much of today's production is designed for short life cycles. Um, and this is to encourage consumers to buy new garments instead of making long lasting or for recycling. But we have an amazing alternative called slow fashion. Slow fashion is a widespread reaction to fast fashion and it encourages slower, as its name states, and ethical production. There is no rush and there is more time taken to ensure the quality and value of the product and also ensure fair, fair wages are provided to workers as well. Additionally, there are other advantages that include encouragement of lower carbon footprint and ideally it makes zero waste as it aims to re reduce vastly the textile waste clogging our landfills. So no methane, which is a greenhouse gas, is produced. Another thing that makes the environmental impact low is that the garments of slow fashion are often made of linen and organic cotton, which are biodegradable and compostable. Moreover, the pieces are produced locally or in-house, so the supply chain process and labor conditions are fully controlled, meaning that there is no need to produce at a mass scale. This is to ensure that by being responsible in our consumption or things of things um, and promoting conscious consumerism, the environment and people will be benefit. If we as consumers have social environmental awareness and responsibility and want to purchase a long lasting as it will last you your whole lifetime, well-made sustainable items, then slow fashion is the best option and alternative. So before buying something, we should always ask ourselves, is it truly something that we need or are we just buying it for the sake of it? We need to support ethical clothing brands and slow fashion because that way we will make a change. Slow fashion is also a double win because you are getting high quality 
product while not contributing to these negative um, social and environmental impacts and effects that I mentioned earlier of the fast fashion industry. Furthermore, um, well, there you can see some pictures that are some tips um, about slow fashion and just sustainable and ethical fashion in general, and you can read them. And also um, another alternative for fast fashion, instead of using fast fashion, um, and which is a very fun alternative, is making your own textile with natural pigments. And it is now that uh, we will do that in the workshop. Um, okay, so now I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, natural pigments in general and also fabric and fibers. And we are also going to make, be doing this workshop of natural pigments. Um, okay, so you can, make, you can use many things as pigments, but not everything has dyeing properties. And that is something we must take into consideration. Um, there are some basic groups that you can classify these natural pigments. The first group being of plants. Um, one I would recommend a plant is laurel. Um, and here I have some laurel leaves so you can see the reference. And this will give you a yellow beige tone. Another leaf you can use is all types of eucalyptus. The second group is flowers. Um, I would recommend using either sunflower, which is a very common type of flower, or lavender flower. Here I have the sunflower. And you can also use, as I mentioned, lavender flowers, and it would give a really pretty color. Another group is roots, and they usually come in powder form, but you can also use them as a whole. I like using turmeric, which gives a very bright yellow tone, um, sometimes kind of orange. And um, another example of another um, powder you can use as a root is madder. Using peels is another good option. Here I have some red onion peel, which you can use and I recommend. And it will give you a yellow brown tone, but if you use yellow or brown peel, it will still produce the same color. Avocado peel is another example of something you can use too. Um, the next group is stems and branches. And an example I have is chamomile. I have it here, which is very common, especially in Peru. Um, so you can use that. And also you can use seeds from plants, which is another group you can classify natural pigments by. And for brownish pink tones, you can use avocado seeds. And since flower seeds are also a great option. Trunks also have dyeing properties, like home oak trunk and bark to produce brown tones, as well as acacia wood. The next option for pigments are clays and soils, specifically red or orange clay. And one of the most common groups is also fruits. And my personal favorite is berries that give these really pretty purple pink tones. And I often use berries as an alternative, uh, but you can use other fruits, but make sure you research before if they have dyeing properties, because I, as I've said, um, not everything has dyeing properties. And for example, in berries, you can use different kinds of berries, um, like raspberries or blueberries or a mixture, depending on the tone you want to achieve. And the second to last group is insects. And the most common example is using cochineal insects, which is a plague or, or parasite that turns the plant into carminic acid and grows on plants. It's very common in Peru, which is where I live. And there are also other types of, of cochineal you can use. Um, one that has the highest carminic acid content or carmine is the great cochineal and they can give mainly different kinds of red. Finally, you can use indigo as a pigment. It comes from indigo fera plants that contain indican, which are fermented to extract the indigo. And it's like a blue color. Um, and this indigo can come in the form of a stone or a powder. 
There are a lot of more examples of each of the groups I mentioned to obtain a variety of different colors that you can search online and also like different tones from those colors. And you can also obviously experiment with different elements of nature that are around you from these groups to extract the dye and if they have dyeing properties. But in that case, I always recommend checking the toxicity levels of the plants and making sure you handle them always carefully and also search um, what color or tone they will um, achieve. Okay, so now that you know a little bit more about these different groups, I'm going to be talking about the fibers and textiles. The two main types are those with natural origins and those with that are synthetic or man-made. And I'm explaining a little bit about these um, natural pigments, the groups, and also fibers, because it will be useful for when we're actually dyeing our clothes, the textile, the fabric. So it is important that um, you listen to this part also. And for dyeing with natural pigments, we must use um, the fibers that are from natural origin, because if we use, for example, clothes from polyester and nylon, the color won't really penetrate that well on the fiber and it will be more faded. So I don't really recommend using synthetic textiles. Um, and so about natural fibers, there are two subgroups that they can be classified in, which are protein-based fibers like wool from sheep or silk from the cocoons of silkworms that eat mulberry and cellulose-based fibers that come from plants and like cotton or jute. And the protein-based textiles absorb colors in a way that it leaves them much brighter and long-lasting. So you can choose either one according to what you want to achieve. But in my case, I will be using cellulose-based since it's the one, the textile I have um, here today. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the process of how to dye with vegetable-based pigments, which is the most common type of dye. Um, now we're going to prepare the fibers and the fabric so that the color is permanent. So you're going to put all the fabric you have in water. So in this case, for example, here I have like a t-shirt, a white t-shirt that is sold, but you can also dye wool or that textile you have here on hand. And you need to add soap powder to make sure and make sure that there is enough foam um, when washing the fabric. And we will wash this fabric in the way that you can put them, um, you can wash them there with the soap powder, or you can put them in the washing machine, whatever is easier for you. In my case, I have already washed my clothes. Um, and it is important to do this part of washing because that way it will ensure that that color is much even. There are also some people that soak um, the fibers or fabrics in soapy water overnight, and then they rinse them truly thoroughly um, the next day too. The next process you're going to do is more than tin. Mordantine, if you didn't know, comes from the word bite in French um, because it kind of like bites the color. So if you don't mordant the fabric or the fiber that you're using for your dyeing, when you wash the fabric or the yarn, you may lose some of the color or it will fade with light. That is why for ensuring long lasting results, you must um, do this process of mordantine. Um, and this is the process I'm going to explain right now. So in traditional dyeing, they use salts that are extremely toxic, but the only safe one that is harmless is potassium alum, which I have here, which is used for cooking, um, for making preserves, or also as a deodorant. And then also um, cream of tartar, which is also commonly used in baking. So all of these uh, materials you will need for this process, you can purchase in different stores and also you can search online if you can find them, but they are pretty, pretty easily to find, especially for example, the 
pigments I mentioned, like fruits or vegetables, there are things you have um, on your house. So this uh, morlantine process involves the boiling of the fibers with these salts, these two salts I already mentioned, and letting them boil for one hour or let them stay overnight. And there are two different formulas depending on the base of the fibers, which I already explained previously, cellulose base or protein based. So remember we have those two types. And me, I'm personally going to prefer that cellulose based um, fiber since I have this that is made of cotton. And the more than the formula for the cellulose based fibers is 10% of, of the weight that the close um, weights in potassium alone. So in this case for cellulose based, it's important to remember that we're just using potassium alone. And potassium alone will, is what fixes the color. And we also have these, the other one, the other salt that is cream of tartar. And that opens the fiber so that it can receive um, a better penetrate, making the color brighter. But since we're using cellulose based fibers, as I mentioned, um, we do not use cream of tartar since it won't really work and it will even um, may damage the, the fibers. Um, so these mordants will only dissolve in hot water. So we need to wait for them to fully dissolve in water and then we'll add that fiber, your clothes, textiles. And it's important to know that the quantity of water isn't really important as long as they are covered with water and they can move around freely. So if the fiber doesn't move freely, you can always add more water or use a bigger container. So I'm going to bring my water. Okay, so here I have my hot water and you need to be very careful with this. So you can put it in a bowl like this. The bowl um, size depends on what you're dyeing. So maybe if you're dyeing something really small, you don't need such a big bowl. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize to my dog. But if you're dyeing um, something much bigger, then you'll need a bigger bowl. So basically here I'm going to pour the water and remember that the cloth you add needs to move freely. Um, and if not, you can always add more water. So I'm going to be doing that. Okay, so after one hour that um, you can turn off the heat and also leave um, your clothes to soak overnight so that the fires absorb all these salts I mentioned. Um, so remember the quantity of the, the salts you need to add. In the case of that you are using a um, protein based, you need to also use cream of tartar here. So, but in my case, I won't be using it. So once the fiber um, are more dense, you can use them directly for dyeing. So you shouldn't rinse them or dry them at all. And um, so if you don't, you aren't going to use them right away for this next process I'm going to explain of dyeing, you can put them into a container with a lid and keep them in the fridge or freezer to preserve, preserve them. Um, and each time you will use it, in the case of you do, you put many clothes, um, you can take it out and before you um, do this next process. So now we are going to, get ready to start this dyeing process. So as I mentioned before, we're going to first start working with these uh, vegetable-based pigments, which means that they come from plants, as I explained previously. Um, in this group, we have, just to remind you, we have flowers, peels, leaves, stems, fruits, seeds, barks, and roots, and we'll extract the colors of them by boiling them. So this whole process um, mainly includes heat and the pigments that are tougher to get, like for example, roots or stems, like barks and seeds, um, should be left to soak on water overnight. But that is on, only if the 
uh, pigments are tougher to get like those ones. And that way um, the color would be more intense. And for the other ones, especially um, flowers or other plants, like for example, onion skins, um, it's not necessary to do that since it's easier to extract the color. Okay, so I personally going to use onion skins, which as I said, it was kind of like a brownish color, a brownish tone. So I'm going to take another material and bring it to show you. And also to add um, for vegetable based pigments, um, if you're using flowers, bark, leaves, and stems, it's also important to filter them. So if no, if you don't do that, it's difficult to clean the fiber um, once you have boiled it. So it's better to um, to filter them previously. Okay, so now I have um, my next material, which I'm going to be using. Um, so you're going to be using this which is kind of like a cotton gauze. And it's basically for the case, for example, of onions. So I'm going to be putting them and showing you how to make it. Okay, so in the gauze you're going to put, for example, I have like red onion skins, and then you're kind of closing it and knotting it to make a kind of tea bag for the next process. So I'm doing that right now. And make sure that it's well secured so it doesn't filter. So you can tie a knot several times. So the best, best way of explaining what I made is this tea bag, um, which is like a tea bag, which will ensure that the skin does not go out, but the color is um, transmitted and absorbed by the fiber. And for example, in the case that you're using fruits like berries, you make sure that you uh, it is well crushed before you boil the berries. So if you don't have, for example, I have here a modern pestle. So that is a very useful tool for, for the fruits. But in case you don't have this, you can use other utensils you have on your kitchen, like for example, wooden spoons and crush it, but make sure it is well crushed so it can work better as a pigment. Um, and in terms of the quantity of these vegetable pigments, you will need like, um, it depends on how, inten how intense you want your pigment to be. So the percentage really depends on that. Um, and also the amounts that you are dying. So now let's move on to the next procedure. And um, well, like I explained, you already have here your cotton gauze wrapped around um, your onion skin to form this kind of tea bag. Um, and I do this generally because it's easier and also because you don't, you just need to boil it once and the pigment in the tea bag with the fiber and you also use less energy instead of doing it twice, boiling the, the whole thing twice. So it's much more efficient. Um, but the other way would be to boil the onion peel for an hour and then remove the peel um, and just use the water to boil with the fiber because you don't want the onion skins floating around like with your cloth. So that is why I use this because it's much easier, um, less time consuming and also less energy is used. So after one hour, um, you take out the fiber, which you put in this, um, which you put in the container to boil it alongside the tea bag you made. And so after this one hour, um, you take it out and then you make sure that um, the whole time, the water as well in this part is at the top 
and um, your fiber is floating freely, you also make sure that the cotton gauze um, is um, below the water and also moving freely. And if not, you always can add more water. But it will it should always be covered with water. And for this part, it's important to use wooden utensils in the boiling part because um, pigments sometimes react with metal utensils and it's also much safer when using heat. So you should always try using wooden utensils. So before, um, before you put your clothes, um, your fabric in the pot to boil it alongside your cotton gauze and your natural pigment. Um, if you want, you can make these different tie-dye techniques. It this will apply if you're using, for example, a shirt. So in this case, you have in the screen different tie-dye techniques you can use, including stripes, rainbows, um, crumple, folded, um, square, folded triangle, amongst others. So there, before you place your t-shirt inside the, the stove with, with your natural pigment, you can tie um, your clothes, your t-shirt with, um, with this string and make sure you tie it well so you can form these different patterns that you can see in the screen. You are also welcome to take a screenshot of these so you have it there. And if you um, know other tie-dye techniques or want to try any other, you can always search on the internet for more designs. So that is basically the whole process of dyeing with natural pigments. Um, I don't know if any of you have any questions or want to share maybe if you have already experienced dyeing with natural pigments. Um, if um, okay, so I have a question. Which dye source have you found to make the brightest colors? So personally, my favorite would definitely be berries, but they are, um, of course, a little bit more expensive, especially if you are dyeing in larger quantities because they produce my favorite colors, which are um, pinks and purples. So um, those are very good pigments, um, especially raspberries or berries in general create very nice pigments. And um, also I wanted to mention that if you use, for example, soil, which is a classification of the pigments I mentioned earlier, um, that is a little bit of a different process. So remember this process I have explained is a general process, um, especially for things like the classification like fruits, I mentioned skins or those types of things, but also for cochineal, which is the insect I mentioned, it's also a different process, um, which involves different things, but this is the main process um, and the one I personally use because I personally haven't died with those insects. So I would definitely recommend if you haven't never um, naturally died um, anything that you try it because it's really fun and you learn a lot of things. You also experiment with nature around you, which is so much fun. Um, I personally have uh, in my country house, which I have a lot of different plants and fruits. So it is always fun to experiment with um, different natural pigments. And yes, that's basically my workshop. Um, if you have any questions now or in the future, you can always write to my email. I will put it right now in the chat. I think there are a couple more questions in the Q and A. Um, do you, can you see it, or would you like me to read the questions? Sorry, I didn't see that that section, but I will read them right now. Okay, so the first question is: um, the onion pigment leaves any smell on the fabric? Um, as they are natural pigments, it leaves a little bit of smell depending on the fruit you use. Um, but that is why, because you use these different salts I mentioned previously, these ones, is that 
you will ensure that the dye will be permanent. So you can always wash um, your clothes that you dye with natural pigments after this whole process. And that way the smell, you will get rid of the smell. So don't worry about the smell, but of course, like working with natural pigments, um, you're going to get some smell. And there is also another question. Um, apart from onions, can you name other pigment sources? Um, yes, of course. So there are different groups that I mentioned at the beginning and um, that you can classify them. So the first group is plants. Um, and that is, I recommend it in plants, for example, laurel and eucalyptus. Um, those leaves are very um, good, give a good pigment and they um, provide yellow beige tones. But there are also um, other groups as flowers. Um, and I would recommend using, for example, sunflower, which is a very common flower or lavender flower too. And they have a really pretty color. And there are also roots and that they usually come in powder. For example, here I have, um, here I have um, one kind of root. And this root gives um, yellow tones, very bright tones, um, also kind of orange. And you can also use, um, for example, that, that was turmeric. I don't know if I mentioned it, but um, you can also use, for example, mother or peels, like I used onion peels that I already mentioned, and also stems, branches, those kind of things, soil, acacia wood. Um, you can use different um, classifications also, and not so easy to use because it involves another process that I mentioned is um, cochineal, which is very common in Peru. And, but that involves another process and that is classified by insects. Um, but yes, you can also, like I said, experiment with different pigments that you have around you or search on the internet if they actually have dye, good dyeing properties and um, always check on the toxicity of the plants and make sure that you handle them carefully and responsibly, especially if you're co collecting them. And yes, yeah, so that's very important. But yes, there are a lot of various pigments I have not mentioned, but those are the ones I would recommend. Yes, yeah, so about the white shirt, um, that was an old shirt. So you can always use um, especially old clothes for dyeing. And for example, um, if you use clothes that already have a color, make sure that you know kind of what color it will form because it will depend on that. So um, it's better to use um, white clothes, white colors, and you can dye different things, not only t-shirts, you can dye everything you want and you can use those tie-dye tie patterns. So yes. Also about slow fashion, um, another alternative, for example, I think you asked that if you don't find any slow fashion brands, you can always research depending on where you live. But if you do not find any um, slow fashion brands around you or that you can purchase, you can always um, use secondhand clothing, which is something I think is very common in the US, in Peru not so much, but it is starting in there are different initiatives, um, um, especially in Peru that I know that are new. And there are great initiatives of um, selling secondhand clothing from some uh, friends or girls I know from my school. So that are, those are great initiatives. Um, but slow fashion, definitely, I talked a lot about slow fashion because it's kind of like the opposite of fast fashion. But of course, there are other alternatives you can use instead of fast fashion. Even like um, repurposing old, old clothes, which is something I love doing because you can um, explore your creativity. You can use old clothes for cutting them, sewing them, creating new pieces, getting inspiration. For example, Pinterest is a great source of inspiration and you can um, personalize the clothes based on your style, your personal style. So that is definitely also another thing you can do instead of buying fast fashion. But yes, it's definitely um, very sad that most brands we know, most brands we purchase from are fast fashion because literally the vast majority, almost all brands are fast fashion. Even if you don't know that they were fast fashion, they are probably fast fashion. Um, so yes, it's important 
to find brands that you like thrift shopping, which I already mentioned, very common in the US. Um, and there are also other things you can do or donating clothes um, with your friends. Maybe you can exchange clothes. There are different alternatives, but you can always find a way to avoid fast fashion. And it's important to try to avoid, avoid it as much as possible. So I have another question. What is the best technique to use? And um, if you mean of dyeing, it would be the best technique, the one I already showed you, um, because it would really assure that the dyes are permanent. For example, I also uh, have seen on the internet a lot of different processes that do not include using salts as these. Um, table salt. Um, you could use table salt, but it doesn't really work that well. So I would definitely recommend if you really want a long lasting piece and um, when you dye your fabric, you should use these different salts. And um, depending on the, if it's cellulose based, um, protein based, plant based. So um, depending on what is based your clothes. So you should research before applying these natural dyes because of that, as I mentioned, would also depend on what salts you use and the percentage. So that I would say is the best technique. Okay, well, if we don't have any more questions, um, I know that you've done the, there's one picture that you sent in of you wearing a shirt that you dyed. Um, do you have like maybe any other examples that you could show everyone of, of, the, of the stuff you've dyed? I have them, but not here right now. Um, but you can always email me and I can send you the examples. Or if not, you can always research on the internet because I actually have right now a few days ago come back to, um, to Lima because I was in another place. So right now I don't have my, um, I have them in my house. But um, I can always send you, as I said, pictures. I will leave right now my email, so you can send me an email if you want pictures of reference. If not, you can always search on the internet. There are a lot of different pictures. And um, as you mentioned also in the poster about this workshop, there was also me and an example of the um, natural dye I used. So I will send my email right now in the chat. I don't know if you all received it because I think I can only send a chat to the panelists. So I will save my email right now so you can write it down. Um, it's okay, thank you. <laughs> but it's um, eapan um, at santilvestre.edu.pe. And you can also message me through Instagram. My Instagram is Estefi Apan, and it's written like my name right now. Um, so yes, you can always message me if you have any further questions um, or send me pictures if you're trying these processes and techniques. Um, yes. So I see there are no more questions. Remember, you can always leave them um, if you have another questions, but I can share a bit about um, other alternatives too. You can also, um, well, I said Sue, but you can also um, try crochet which is a uh, really pretty techniques. Um, I see it's very popular right now all over social media and you can make um, these beautiful patterns um, and dif use different colors. So that would be a great way of making your own clothes. Personally, I am very interested in fashion. So that is a great way. Um, you can also find other ways to, to avoid this issue of fast fashion. So I have another question. What's your favorite piece you've made yourself? So um, personally, I really like the ones I have done with berries, with raspberries. Um, and because they, as I said, it's like my favorite color they produce. They produce this really wonderful and very bright. Um, purple and pink. So that would be my favorite. And also, um, I wanted to share, since there are no more questions, 
that I personally also do art. So I'm very interested in art and fashion. So, and those are two are connected, but um, I have made, for example, a piece, an art piece about different environmental issues, including pollution, um, climate change, deforestation, habitat loss, amongst others. And I really think that art in general and fashion includes art definitely because it's an art itself. Um, you can express yourself in such a creative way. And um, it's a great way of communicating a message. So for example, in the art piece I made, it was conveying a message that we need to do something about these environmental issues and we need to take action and raise awareness. Um, but maybe your message is another one, a different one. It doesn't need to be as um, that kind of message. It could also be a more simple message, but it's a great way of expressing yourself. It's mainly really fun. I love doing art because it's so fun. And you have such a huge variety of things you can do through art. And so I think that connects with a question also um, in the chat is, that you, do you think that creativity helps you engage more in conservation? And I would say that definitely. And it's kind of also the message I want to transmit. For example, this year that I am the ESD official at my school, San Silvestre School, which is that you can always connect your own personal interests to sustainability and taking care of the environment. My personal interest could be in this case, art or fashion, but also another of my interest is sustainability and taking care of the environment and ocean conservation. But in the case that maybe it's not something that you are passionate about, um, as I said, you can always find a way to connect your everyday things you do, everyday actions, everyday habits to conservation and to, um, to taking care of the environment, to sustainability. There is always a way, and I assure you that you can find it. Um, so I definitely encourage you all to find that thing that interests you. Probably everyone that is here is interested also in sustainability and taking care of the environment and the ocean. But if you have friends or people you know that are not necessarily interested in those um, topics, because there are a lot of people, sadly, that are not really engage with all these issues um, and are aware that is something that we should really um, tackle and really find solutions, even simple solutions. Um, so tell them that there is always a way to connect their interests. It could be things as sports that you don't think it necessarily would connect to sustainability, but I assure you it will and you can find different ways. Or it could be things as for example, well-being also has a lot to do with sustainability and sustainable development goals. Um, and there are a lot of different aspects that you do not necessarily connect with taking care of the environment, but there is always, I will assure you that you will always find in your life something you can do to connect it to sustainability or to generally just make a positive impact in the world since it is something that we desperately need nowadays. So I have still some minutes for questions. So if anyone wants to make a question, it could also be a question about myself um, regarding sustainability, anything in general, you can make it through the chat or through the question and answers uh, box. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, the question is, what got you into fashion um, in the first place? And well, I got into fashion um, I just always have really loved being creative and really loved art since a young age. And I have always found it so um, cool and um, entertaining to um, express myself through fashion or also, um, for example, something that is um, something that happens a lot of, to a lot of people that uh, connecting it to fast fashion is that Fast fashion um, focuses so much on trends that people always, always, always want to buy from those stores. For example, um, Forever 21, Over and Out, Peters, those stores that have like really popular um, pieces of clothing, Sarah, 
um, and a lot of people purchase from them because they are always up to date with the trends. As I said, um, they are they always keep changing their their clothing based on the different trends that emerge. But um, it is important, like luckily, for example, um, also something that has um, increased my interest for fashion has been seen through social media, different um, different people and different styles and kind of using that as a way to find myself and my, um, my identity, like what I like and um, expressing myself through fashion. So that is something that has interest me and seeing all the trends, obviously you want to purchase and be um, trendy and follow the trends and have everything that everyone has. Um, and also because it is very cheap, something I have seen that is kind of a trend of the trend is buying from Sheen, which is a fast fashion company. And a lot of people buy like, so many clothes from there, um, so many different pieces of clothes that you can get. Um, obviously you get them in a cheaper price and um, that is why they um, consume and buy so many clothes. But you really, if you have the possibility of buying from sustainable fashion brands, slow fashion brands, you have the resources to access those brands, you should definitely try to because I know that you will obviously think that oh because it's cheap and I would have more clothes at the end that you will want to buy it but in the end like see all the environmental impacts and social impacts I mentioned like it's about being empathetic and also thinking about okay maybe I don't see it personally like every day in front of me all these workers living in horrible conditions but it is it exists and it is there so think about them and if you are lucky enough to have access to um, resources and can afford buying from these companies um, that are not fast fashion, please do so or please try to. Or also just not throwing away your old clothes or and repurposing them or keep using them because if they're not in this horrible state, in this horrible condition, you can always use them. If you don't want, if you get bored of your clothes, you can always repurpose them and give them life and give them a new um, purpose. Not necessarily, you can also make, for example, handbags from clothes. There are so many things you can make and um, explore your creativity through um, this repurposing and you can search for Pinterest. I would say Pinterest is a great, um, source of inspiration and a great way to start your journey into sustainable fashion into different alternatives for avoiding fast fashion so I would say you can always search there um, and find inspiration and what I wanted to say is that um, please try to spread the message to people that you know around you about fast fashion industry, because sadly it's not talked about enough, especially not talked about how it is connected to the ocean and to these different environmental and social impacts. So try to raise awareness of what you have learned today and also about the alternatives. And for example, that workshop we did of using natural dyes. Um, so more people are aware, aware of the pressing issue that is fast fashion and um, want to be part of this um, slow fashion and want to be part of the solution. So you have the power to transmit this message. You have the power to make a change. And just start, I would suggest starting with little things and then you can do much bigger things. And if you, for example, tell your friends about these little things you're doing, it will be such a big and greater change and you will inspire um, positive action for achieving a much brighter future, a better world for, for all. So um, yes, yeah, start with small things and then um, you will accomplish greater changes. And 
um, never forget that we have the power, we are the future. We as young generation um, should speak up about things that matter, things that matter to us and things that concern us that are um, happening around the world. So yes, I would say that and that is something that you should take away from this workshop and this um, introduction to sustainable fashion. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to Estefania for that great workshop and the discussion on fast and slow fashion. I think something that I've personally like noticed and resonated with is like when you do, you know, buy lots of clothing, um, you never really get that sense of fulfillment and like happiness. Um, and it's very momentary as compared to, you know, really engaging with your creativity, as you said, and doing like things that making clothes that, you know, you know, you will like. So thank you so much for that, um, that great workshop. Um, my name is Ejen um, and I am 16 and a member of the World Ocean State Youth Advisory Council. And I'll be introducing a couple of the next sessions.